Good evening, everyone. Good evening, and welcome to Science on Tap. Good evening. Uh, thanks uh, for everyone coming on such a gorgeous day. Hard to tear yourself away from whatever you're doing outside. Um, welcome to Science on Tap. My name is Susan Knight. I work at UW Trout Lake Station up the road about 10 miles. And Science on Tap is an example of the Wisconsin idea where the borders of the university are the borders of the state. We set up an opportunity for you here to hear um, some science, some research going on, and to ask questions rather than have uh, a whole presentation. This is really turned over to you to, uh, to ask all the questions that you have. I want to remind you about all of our partners we have with Science on Tap. We have the University of Wisconsin uh, Trout Lake Station, University of Wisconsin Kemp Natural Resources Station, the Manaqua Public Library, the Lakeland Badger Chapter of the Wisconsin Alumni Association, and of course our hosts here, the Manaqua Brewing Company. And Science on Tap is brought to you uh, by a grant from the Brittingham Fund of the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And you all know that there are many ways to watch. You can come right here and watch right from here. We also have live streaming at the Manaqua Public Library, anytime you would rather go there. Um, we also have live streaming for anyone with an internet connection. And it's ad-free, and you can watch from the comfort of your home, or if it's in the middle of the winter and you happen to be in Florida, you can watch us down there. And on top of that, you can watch any event later. We, um, we archive all of our entire presentations, and then we also create a five to 10 minute short of each presentation so that you can get a little flavor of all the different, um, all the different events. So we will not have Science on Tap uh, the next two months, July or August. This is the last one of this year. Uh, the brewery's busy, everybody's busy. Um, but our next Science on Tap will be September 6th, and our topic will be the future of farming in Wisconsin with Paul Mitchell. He's an associate professor in the Department of Agriculture and Applied Economics. Um, we'll also have a really cool field trip uh, a couple days after. So usually our field trips have been on the Thursday immediately after the field trip, but this or after the Science on Tap event. But this year it's going to be on a Saturday, so those of us that work can actually come as well. And we're going to probably do three different things. We're going to visit an aquaponics um, uh, culturing farm in right in Hazelhurst. We're going down to see a ginseng farm down near Wausau, and we're also going to see an automated robotic uh, dairy farm down in the Wausau area where the cows decide when it's time to come in and get milked, and they go up, they, they get washed off and milked and go on their way. I, 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 it's going to be quite a, quite a sight. So, um, so just to remind you, you can't sign up yet, but we will be sending out emails uh, sometime in August, probably the 1st of August, and we'll send a couple of reminders. We will, uh, because our next Science on Tap is September 6th, and the field trip is immediately after, you're really going to have to sign up before you get reminded about it um, at our Science on Tap. So watch for those emails, and it should be, um, it should be a really great presentation and um, a really fun, fun field trip. So watch your email in August. But tonight, we have Dr. Michael Wyman of, the, of UW-Madison to discuss the wonderful world of wood. And I know there are a couple of people out here who are really excited about this because they are into wood in a big way. So uh, Mike Wyman is a wood technologist and botanist with the USDA Forest Service Forest Products Lab on the UW-Madison campus. And their mission is to study the properties of wood and use our diminishing supplies of wood as efficiently as possible. So Mike has had a fascinating and rich background. He was born on Long Island, grew up in New Jersey, hightailed it out of there as soon as he could, and went to Paul Smith School of Forestry uh, in upstate New York. He finished his undergraduate degree at North Carolina State, and he was planning to go to grad school from there, but it was 1969, and we all know what was going on then, and he was drafted uh, into the Army. Uh, lucky for him, he ended up in Germany and not Vietnam, but when he got back to the uh, States, he got his master's degree at Syracuse University in New York. He then joined the Peace Corps, and he was stationed in Liberia. 
He pursued a PhD at Syracuse, but detoured to Costa Rica to study for tropical forestry and finished his degree at Louisiana State University. He returned to Africa for a forestry job in Ethiopia. Wow, he has really been around. So he followed that up with a postdoc working with colleagues at North Carolina State and the University of Florida, reconstructing the, or the Oregon, the state of Oregon climate from millions of years ago using um, ancient wood fossils. He's now at the USDA Forest Products Lab in Madison studying wood anatomy, and one facet of his job is helping customs officials identify imported wood products suspected of being made from uh, prohibited woods, so woods that you're not supposed to be using. He's recently back from Gabon, and hopefully he will tell us what he had been up to there. Now, if you've been paying attention, you've just learned that he lived in at least seven states, six countries, learning about forestry wherever he went, so he really knows his stuff. All right, so here's your trivia question. Mike attended Paul Smith College, his forestry college, which Mike describes as lumberjack college. Which of these useful life skills were taught at this school? A, the number of pine needles you're likely to find on a 50-foot tall white pine tree. How to talk to girls. The names of all the parts of a draft horse's harness or all the words to Monty Python's lumberjack song. All of the... No, he did not learn to talk to girls. No girls allowed. He uh, learned the names of all the parts of the draft horse harness, which I guess was very important. So I'll turn it over to Mike. Thank you, Mike, for being here. Okay. Okay, well, thanks for that introduction. And she mentioned that there are a bunch of, uh, a lot of woodworkers here. Do anybody here know about the International Wood Collectors Society? That's a great group to get affiliated with because they have annual meetings. It's people that work with wood, um, and they have very interesting and fun meetings every year. So if you work with wood and you want to meet other people that work with wood, that's a great group to uh, affiliate yourself with. Um, yeah, I've had kind of a varied career. The, the, the reason that learn to talk to girls was not one of the answers is at Paul Smith's, there were maybe... There were hotel management, forestry, and a few liberal arts students. And there were maybe 500 men and 50 women at the college. <laughs> so um, you didn't get that much chance to uh, talk to them because the fraternity boys pretty well took over that. <laughs> um, but it was a great place to go to school. It reminded, go, going to school in the Adirondacks, it, living in the Adirondacks is a lot like living in the north woods of Wisconsin. You know, I, go, I mean, it's just so striking you know, the same kind of geography, the, the bogs, the lakes. The, um, and so it was really, it's really great to be back here and feel like I'm back up in upstate New York again. Um, uh, pretty much, that, that rundown was pretty good. Um, and I'm hoping to get some questions from you. But um, I started in a forestry school largely because I wanted to get out of New Jersey. And I liked the woods, and I thought that would be as good a, uh, a start as any. And it was, in fact, although I got more interested in wood than, say, in growing trees. So I went into a wood technology program at North Carolina State University, where, to my amazement, I was able to identify pieces of wood, you know, as opposed to just trees. And I really, really enjoyed doing that. It was just so nice to pick up a piece of wood, cut the end of it, look at it with my hand lens, and know what it was. Uh, but in the United States, we have certainly a limited number of woods, maybe, what, at most 100, typically maybe fewer than 50. But when I went overseas to Liberia, there they have thousands of species of wood, and they're all really different, and they're also different in their anatomy. And it was just like, wow, this is incredible. Um, and so it was really exciting to me. So I got really hooked on tropical wood anatomy, and, and actually never really left that. Um, being in the Army in Germany, of course, out in field exercises, we go out in the woods, and basically they had fewer trees there than we have here. You know, so that was less exciting. That was only interesting in that it struck me just how diverse the United States resource is compared with other temperate areas, um, especially the east. But in Liberia, 
uh, I was lucky because I was in a UN financed project, which means there was actually some sort of funding and some interest in doing something. And even though there was not much uh, money available for the drying project that I was expected I to work on, there was no equipment to do it. But I was able to pick up some wood samples on some trips I took up country. People in sawmills would give me samples. And so I basically I collected um, a lot of samples of wood that were found commercially, stopping at sawmills, um, just cutting down some trees from you know, the local forest, going to where lumbering operations were, and asking them to give me a, a, just a chunk of their wood. And so I made a wood identification key, which was one of the most fun projects I'd done um, because it basically incorporated all of my interest in wood anatomy, and I learned a lot more about wood than I ever would have learned just studying the temperate species of the United States. So that kind of got me interested in wood anatomy, but there's just so far you can go with wood anatomy, too. And in Costa Rica, when I went, I went down there to teach, but I also was making a wood collection, and they had no keys to the identifications of their woods. You know, the, the people who used woods knew the few species that they were used to using. So I, again, made a collection of woods in Costa Rica, made a wood identification key, and th which I used at the university for the students who um, were in the wood technology program. And it's interesting, there were not that many of them in Costa Rica, which was surprising because as a tropical country, they had lots and lots of wood, and they didn't use all that much of their research. They didn't know as much about it as you might have expected. So it was a really wonderful job because there was everything to do, and in that case, there were plenty of resources to do it. Costa Rica is a fairly advanced country. There was enough budget for me to travel around the country, collect wood samples, see the country, and then analyze that data into these wood identification keys, which were used by the students. Um, which was also very advantageous because as students, they were constantly questioning, well, I don't see this, I don't see that. And so I was able to correct all of the, um, of the, the, the challenges in the key, the places where people would be confused, because I had a lot of feedback from students who basically um, were trying to uh, find out ways to say that I didn't necessarily know what I was doing, <laughs> which in many cases was true. But if you have the proper frame of mind, that could actually be parlayed into very um, uh, useful uh, approaches to your research in that case. Um, anyway, that was very successful in Costa Rica. But my last year there, I met a tropical ecologist from LSU who was interested in some very unusual wood density changes in tropical trees that were not found in temperate trees. And he basically helped me to get enter a, a PhD program at LSU with funding to go to Costa Rica, collect increment cores from the trees, that is, you take a little sample out from the bark to the center of the tree, and just analyze the wood from the center of the tree to the bark. That was a really, really fun project, um, because different areas of the country, different rainfall regimes and temperature regimes ended up with extremely diverse um, wood properties um, and with that, wood anatomical changes. And you could basically, um, looking at the habitat of where certain kinds of trees were growing, trees that required a lot of light, for instance, sometimes produced older wood that was maybe four times as dense as the wood in the center. This was all new to me and really exciting. So I spent several years then working on this tropical ecology project. Um, finished my degree on that, and needed a job. So they were looking for someone to teach wood technology courses to forestry students in Ethiopia. Now, my first reaction is, Ethiopia? What have they got besides desert? Well, it turns out they have maybe 4% forested land. And because they have so little forestry land, they have to pay attention to what they've got. So that's what I was there, teaching the forestry students basically the properties of the wood, and how they could better preserve the resource they had and maximize its utilization. Um, it was fairly challenging because they had just had a, just come off a revolution, and the war hadn't exactly stopped yet. You know, so they was shooting on campus, and we were closed for two months. But still, it was um, an interesting time. I was able to 
do uh, the kind of work I wanted to do, you know, taking into account all of these challenges of the circumstances there. Um, but after two years, when my contract was up, I had enough of Ethiopia. So I came back to the States, and at this point, of course, the world of wood anatomists is very small. So basically, everybody knows everybody. And some colleagues from North Carolina, where I had graduated, what, 15, 20 years earlier, were doing a project where they wanted to predict what the paleoclimate was in this, from this assemblage of woods that they had collected in Oregon, fossil woods, 20-something million years old, and they wanted somebody, a postdoc, to do the work of looking at the anatomy of the woods and find out from the wood anatomy if you could figure out what the climate was back then. Well, this was new to me, too. It was, I didn't realize um, the extent to which you could actually predict climate from wood anatomy. But, you, but we made thin sections of all these um, uh, fossil woods that one of my colleagues had collected, the, the one from... NC State and Florida, and analyzing the size of the vessels, the arrangement of different kinds of tissues, how wide some elements were, how many of one type of element there were. You could actually, using samples of wood from areas of known climate, and this is where I would go to a reference collection of woods, and you'd find out a small area, let's say Kemp Station. You'd look at all the woods that were growing on Kemp Station, look at the anatomy of those woods, and relate the overall anatomy of all of these woods to the general climate now at Kemp Station. I did that for maybe 50 sites around the world. So there were several in Florida, because Florida has very diverse uh, 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 species mix, unlike the fur further north. But you could find there was a definite trends for some wood anatomical characters with different climate variables, especially the mean annual temperature, but to a lesser extent, the amount of rainfall. And doing this all around the world, checking stations, uh, sites that were close to weather stations, we'd find out what the overall wood physiognomy, we call it, which would be the, the aggregate of all the wood anatomical characters, and relate that to the climate there. Then I looked at the overall anatomy of these fossils that were collected in Oregon and find out where in the world do these wood characters show up now? What, under what climatic situation? And you know it was different because some of the woods that were collected in northern Oregon were palms, bananas. Right? Obviously, something had changed. Um, and so looked at that and decided that it was a, um, s s you know, moderate rainfall tropical area. That, that is, the kind of woods that grow there now grow in areas that have fairly high temperatures, maybe like mid-Florida, and uh, moderate but not excessive rainfall. But of course, this, this, this uh, certainly requires a lot of assumptions, because not only do you have the wood characteristics that are changing, but over many millions of years, the whole possibility of species didn't exist. I mean, some species never existed yet, and so they would not have been represented in the modern thing. So there are certainly questions about, is this valid? It looked pretty valid to me, but one thing I've learned is that I never have final answers, that what I like is doing the research and coming up with what I would call a tentative answer. And so I did, I did that with the Oregon, and then I got very interested in this um, fossil anatomy then, in this wood physiognomy study. And later on, I had some other colleagues who had met me at professional meetings um, where I had given a talk or two on using fossil wood anatomy to uh, say what the climate was back then. And they had a project in Ethiopia, of all places. It, <laughs> so, I went back to Ethiopia for a month with them. We basically we stayed in tents way out in the, in the, the countryside. It's very dry. Um, there were people tending cows in what was mostly scrub vegetation and grass, right? No major trees. 
but I collected a lot of fossil woods myself. I, I took a, a geologist hammer and cut off chunks of these wood. We had them sent to a geology lab where they made wood slides, thin sections of these, and I looked at the wood anatomy of that and compared what the wood anatomy on these, basically there were stumps that were maybe typically this high, some of them were maybe 10 feet high still, just the, the remnants of these tree stumps. And I took these chunks of wood, sent them off, looked at the slides, tabulated the data on the wood anatomy, and then tried to match it up with what they have now. And by the way, it's interesting because the kids out there who are basically, I mean, they're not going to school. They're out in rural Ethiopia, and they're tending cows, and they're bored out of their minds. So these foreigners come, and they start hacking away at these stumps, and they're thinking, what in the world? And I remember one of them, I, I had known a little bit of Amharic, which is the native language, from my previous stay in Ethiopia. So um, one of these kids comes running up to me and says, work, 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 which in Amharic means gold. He could not figure out, he figured I must have discovered some kind of gold, because it would never have occurred to them to go cutting off chunks of rock. To them, they were just stones in the field. If it wasn't worth something tangible like gold, and I remember I, I chipped off a piece of the top, and I took out my little hand lens, and I showed him with the hand lens. You could see growth rings. You could see rays. And he, he just went bug-eyed, you know, to see that all these stones out in the fields were actually tree stumps. It was really great to see their The kids up there, they're, they're really fun. I mean, I don't particularly like kids, but these kids... <laughs> These were nice kids. You know, they're growing up in rural areas. They're, 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 they're very genuine. Um, and so it was really fun. And then they, oh, they just descend on, on you when they find out you're doing something interesting. So that part was fun, too. So now these kids know that they've got what actually could be, if they manage it, an incredible resource. If you go to some of these fossil sites here, they're major tourist attractions. So they could be making a lot more money by getting the Ferenge, which are essentially white foreigners, to come in there just to look at their fossil trees. You know? um, whether that will happen, I don't know. Anyway, that was a great project. I looked at the woods. It looked like the forest there, because these are big trees. Some of these are like two meters in diameter, huge stumps falling over, some of them still standing up. And they look like species that you would find down in, say, Tanzania now where there's higher rainfall. Um, the temperature didn't matter much, but essentially the rainfall uh, changed the structure of the forest so that basically large trees died. Um, I would say the fact that they're all standing up, there was probably there was a lot of volcanic activity. There was probably either volcanic dust or something covered those stumps up, so the trees died, and but remained there intact and didn't decay because they were probably covered with volcanic ash or something like that before it was eroded away. Because if they had just died there under normal circumstance, they all would have rotted away over millions of years. But it looked to me like the kind of forest you might find in Tanzania or southern Kenya. Um, and that's what I proposed to my colleagues. And this is why it's good to work with other people. Because I said, well, this looks like this kind of a forest in Tanzania. And one of my colleagues writes back and says, but that forest, that area now, has lots and lots of grass. And grass had not yet seriously evolved at the time that these trees were um, covered up in volcanic ash or whatever. So I had to revise my thinking on that. But that's why it's good to work with colleagues, because they have different areas of knowledge, things that wouldn't occur to me, like what other non-woody uh, 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 resources are there that can help you reconstruct what the forest might have been. Now, it could be that, that basically Tanzania had the same kind of forest as Ethiopia did, and then grass came in, but by that time, Ethiopia was too dry, and it went to wetter. I don't, I don't know what the answer is. Um, I'll keep working on it until we come up with uh, something that either looks like a plausible answer or I can no longer work on it. But that's one of the projects that I work on that I really like. Now, one of the challenges of that project, though, since I work for the U.S. Forest Service, is to explain why the U.S. government should fund this research. <laughs> but that's not too bad, because now with the all the climate change stuff, 
you just have to say, well, you know, the climate changed there, and this was the consequence. You know, I mean, admittedly, this is looking for an argument to justify what I want to do. But that's okay. It helped. The creative process helps in planning future resource and in analyzing your resource. And it seems to be working so far, right? They are willing to let me do that. Um, I do other things, uh, a lot more practical things, such as how to identify species of wood, especially those which are um, in danger of, of being uh, overexploited to extinction. That's, uh, that's, another, that's a very practical project that I really like doing because it gets me to go to different places. I've given classes in Central America, Honduras, Guatemala, Nicaragua, um, on how to identify the wood to their forestry and customs things and police. People that basically are supposed to be checking up that the resource is being sustainably used and that people are not taking trees which should be protected and trying to sell them by claiming that they're something that they're not. And to do this, you have to teach them how to, how to identify the wood, or at least identify the wood well enough that they can hold it until it can be sent someplace, like to another lab in the United States, for instance, where you can more definitively determine what it is. Um, and the very fact that the people that, are, that might be willing to take the resource out under false pretenses know that there's some possibility of being caught I think somewhat curtails the practice because if nothing else, their, their timber is, um, is being held up. They can't sell it until the whole case is resolved, um, which is also why you don't want to be making too many mistakes because this is costing them money and you don't want to just hold up a legitimate uh, wood exploitation or wood utilization just because you think you might be right. So you want to be somewhat certain. You want the students to have a pretty good idea of what they're doing so that they can catch the ones that are trying to get away with exploiting the resource illegally from those that are trying to use it legitimately. But it's often very hard because many species look similar and you find that like two species of mahogany in Nicaragua, one is prohibited, excuse me, the other is permitted, and so all of a sudden, all of the species that they're cutting are the ones that's permitted. Whereas previously, when they didn't have rules, it was the other one that was being cut. So that's a little suspicious. It might be true. But what happens is one of my colleagues in Oregon uses spectrographic methods, and those are really reliable for the species that it works. Apparently, it doesn't work with all species, but basically, he and I work together. We have... 100,000 wood samples at the Forest Products Lab. I send him just little slivers of wood, and he puts them in his spectrograph, and he builds up this huge database of chemical signatures of these woods. And so that by taking an unknown, you can put it in there, and it will match something up, and it does a really nice job of separating species that you would not otherwise be able to separate. Because wood anatomy has serious limitations. The chemistry of the wood, much fewer although he tells me that there are some groups that still can't be separated by his technique. But with new things coming up all the time, that's the kind of, that's the, that's the way this would probably work, is that someone on the ground would look at a piece of wood, decide that it was or was not probably what the manifest said it was, and then either permit it or maybe send it to a better lab to find out. Um, so that's where I am now, is basically wood identification of endangered species and how they can be distinguished from the species that are not endangered. And that's no, that's no easy task, but doing something is better than doing nothing. And you never know when something might work. So um, that's most of the problem. I try to, I try to slip my, my fossil wood work in there because I really have a good time examining the, I mean, I'm just, to tell the truth, I am astounded. I'm probably as astounded when I first saw the microscope slides of fossil woods and saw the amazing extent to which the wood anatomy was preserved in those fossilized stumps as that kid out in the field in Ethiopia was when I showed him that it was a tree and not a stone. I mean, it's really exciting to, uh, to find out that, you know, to learn something which is entirely 
different to you. I remember seeing fossils as a kid, and I just, you know, it was in the shape of a branch. I had no idea that the whole anatomy of the wood could be completely preserved inside. So that's pretty much the rundown, the, the, the ten-minute version of my professional life. Um, nice thing about the Forest Products Lab is, there's, you know, they've got a long history of doing interesting things. They've got their ups and downs. It's a federal lab, of course, you know, budgets are better or worse. Um, but if you cultivate relationships with other institutions, sometimes when the budget is low, you can find somebody that has money, that's interested in doing something, and as in the case with this person out in Oregon, we have the resource in terms of all these wood samples that have been collected over 100 years, and he has the new technology. So you can team up as we've done. Um, uh, the, the Forest Products Lab wood collection, of course, I'd heard about that even as an undergraduate. So that when I finally got a job there, it was like, oh, wow, I'm going to the Forest Products Lab. And I remember one of my colleagues sent me this email and said, Mike, you're home. And that's how it felt. Because it was like, you know, as an undergraduate, you would write to the lab. They would send you materials for various courses. And now I was going to be working there. And um, it really is great to be working in this wood collection and have access to all of these resources, find out that in these resources, there are a good number of um, misidentifications, but by comparing one with the other, when you work with somebody else, you find that sometimes things don't make sense. And when, and when things don't make sense, it means you're missing information most of the time if your analysis is not completely off. And so we've discovered, for instance, that some of the species in the collection are misidentified, and when you go back to the records of who collected it and when they collected it, you find out that somebody picked it up in a sawmill and somebody told them, it's this species. And so you can say, ah, well, it was, you know, this was collected even before a newer but similar species was even identified botanically and described. So that part actually is fun to go through the collection and find out what's valid and what isn't and propose reasons for why we might change the, uh, the website or the card catalog in the case of some of the old ones to reflect the fact that there might be some mistakes in the collection. And of course, they're important to, collect the, to correct those mistakes because a lot of research is based on what we say something is. You talked about uh, climate. The, these trees that are fossilized, was, what, what was the continent like then? Was it all one big Pangea, you know, you know what I mean? Continental what? drift had happened after the fact? Uh, let's see, I think there's one. Oh, okay, I think that's, uh, yeah, that's it. right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, that's a very interesting question, and for instance, the Oregon, samp the Oregon um, um, fossil assemblage that I first worked on, that's one of, that's one of the things that, uh, that first occurred to me, is that palms and bananas in northern Oregon. So was the climate, was it in the same position, but a much warmer earth back then, or was that part of Oregon much further south and that you had this continental drift so that maybe the planet wasn't warmer maybe that site was warmer because the planet had moved I don't know and I'm that's that's one of the discussions that is ongoing is the climate wasn't really warmer everywhere it's just that things were positioned differently and I don't know that I don't know how you would resolve that uh, you would probably have to go to other sources of information that might you know, that might indicate that everything was in a different position. Or that you had a warmer climate, which is probably part of it anyway. That, uh, you know, the atmospheric gases change, and with the atmospheric gas differences, you have different uh, retention of heat. And, you know, with a lot of volcanic activity maybe 20 million years ago, you may have had heat-trapping gases all over the planet, or at least locally. I don't know the answer. Uh, <clears throat> hmm? What woods did you pass around? 
Well, I passed a cross section of a, was it an oak, Scott? I got these from Scott. Right, right. Yeah. It didn't qualify. Okay. It wasn't a fossil. No, yeah, this is a piece of oak. And basically what this shows is the cross section, right? You see the rings on this one. Many of the tropical species don't show you rings at all. Now, the presence of rings is a very good character because it shows that there was a change in climate through the year, right? Like in temperate zones, that is, you have either a dry season and a wet season, or you have a cold season and a warm season. So that seasonality is what shows up in these rings. In tropical, some tropical woods, you don't get rings. Now, if there's a difference between a wet season and a dry season, you might get rings, but they look different than the rings you get if it's due to co um, cold and hot. That's the cross section. Now, if you cut from the center of the tree to the outside like this, and you look at that, that's a radial section, meaning it's parallel to the rays, which are these bands of tissue that go from the center of the tree out. And if you look at that section, you can see a lot of useful characteristics. You see the kinds of cells that these rays are composed of. One type of cell, two type of cell, whether they're high, not high. Um, in this surface here, it's cut perpendicular to the rays. So now you see these rays, which go like this from the center of the tree, out, coming out at you. And there you can see how many cells wide they are, how many cells high they are, whether there are tubes in the center of them. All, that's just some of the many characters that you would find in a piece of wood, either in a living tree, or if this were one of my fossil woods, I would have taken a split out of this and I would just get this portion. But I could still see what the internal anatomy of that wood was on these slides. So that's what this illustrates, is the, essentially the three directions that are important when you examine a piece of wood for its wood anatomy. Uh, and there's a couple of pieces of fossilized wood here that, that Scott loaned me. Um, the pieces that I collected, like in Ethiopia, they're all, they've all been cut down into slides now. I, it, this is one of these, if I were doing this again, I would situations. <laughs> I would have collected a lot more a lot more of the samples because by the time you finish cutting them into these slides, you're only left with little pieces and it would have been nice if I'd had some large chunks left. Um, plus, one of my colleagues was doing a study on determining how nitrogen content varied over time. And somehow, I'm not exactly clear how he did this, but he wanted the remnants of my fossil woods because he was somehow studying what was left of the nitrogen in this wood to determine what the nitrogen composition in the air was. So that's where the rest of them went. But I, quite frankly, I'm real happy that someone was able to use these little chips that I had left over and would just be sitting in a box somewhere and was actually able to come out with a whole other project based on what was left from these fossil woods. But if I had it to do over again, I'd take a lot more samples and bigger samples. Question here? Yep. Yeah, the... Uh, uh, it, fascinating life story. Thank you for coming. This is really interesting. But a uh, similar theme, but a more compressed uh, timeline. Uh, about 10 years ago, I, I bought a bunch of lumber from a place up in Ashland, which is no longer there, called Timeless Timber. And these were old growth trees that were cut in the 1800s. They sank underwater where it was anaerobic and ice cold. And then they scuba divers brought them up. And I made a bunch of furniture out of this stuff. It's just beautiful. But the... Uh, First, I, I assume this is valid and this wasn't just the marketing department, but uh, also how different are the trees, the, the, the trees that create the lumber we buy today from what was growing in the 1800s? You know, is, is it all recycled and are they, you know, less dense, et cetera, which is what they told me about this wood? Well, I would say the resource now is quite a bit inferior to the old growth resource, right? You had much more uniform growth, smaller Ready growth rings, tighter growth rings. And I'd heard of that timeless timbers. And one interesting thing that I'd read about that is things like the spruce, its acoustical properties were altered by being underwater for 100 years. That it made great, what, soundboards? What do you call them? But that, that's right. And that, and that, being, so, that being underwater for all that time 
improved its acoustical properties. So now whether could that be replicated? I don't know. You know, certainly somebody will probably try to. Um, and aside to that, though, is about harvesting these uh, sunken logs, which of course at the time it was not worth going to the time and effort to get these logs out of the lake or river where they had sunk. Now it is, because the resource is much more valuable. Um, one of the projects I did since I went to the lab was to go to the Panama Canal Zone. There was a company there when they built the Panama Canal. Basically, what they did was they built a dam to stop the Chagres River from flowing directly into the ocean. They built two dams, one on the Atlantic side, one on the Pacific side, and they formed Gatun Lake, which is there now. And the canal, that was the water supply for the canal. Then they built the locks, and basically they would fill the locks by opening the gates and letting them fill with water from Chagres Lake. But it took many years for the lake to fill, and they left the trees standing except for the small area where the ships were going. Now, at first I thought they, they left them standing simply because it wasn't economical to take them out. I've since read that this was, you know, turn of the century, and submarines were just uh, being developed, and that they left these trees standing in the canal, in Gatun Lake, in order to thwart any effort to destroy commercial or military vessels that might be traversing the canal and would be able to, because you couldn't very well manipulate even a small submarine in basically what amounted to an underwater forest. But times change, the canal zone changed hands, they commercialized the canal zone to a greater extent, and this company was now harvesting logs out of the canal zone. And they, but there was no, they didn't know what they were, so they wanted me to go down there find out what might be coming out of the canal, and teach some of their people how to identify them. And what they were doing was, they had these underwater divers. Um, they were the, um, the Kuna Indians that lived in the area. They were always, you know, they were very good divers. You know, and they had hired them to go underwater. In this case, they had oxygen tanks. But they would go underwater with these large pontoons that would be this big around and this high, they would fill them full of water so they'd submerge. They would chain them around these standing trees that were, you know, maybe they were sticking out of the water a foot or two feet. You could see that all over the canal zone, there were little tops of these trees poking out of the water. They would go down there and put one or two of these pontoons on a, tr on a uh, tree, then go under there with compressed air and drive the water out and fill them with air. So now you've got this air-filled pontoon underwater, strapped to this tree. They would have a hydraulic chainsaw. One of these Kuna divers would go there with his hydraulic chainsaw. They cut off the log, and it would come popping out of the lake. And then they would drag it into, uh, into shore. Now, some of these logs were very heavy, and they would sink, even with two pontoons. So then they'd send somebody down to put a third pontoon on it and elevate the log. But it was really great. All of a sudden, this log would pop up, and then the guy with the chainsaw would pop up and jump on top of it with his chainsaw, and they'd haul it all into this floating dock. It was really fun. Now, it must not have been really economical, because they're no longer in business. <laughs> but, huh? That's right, right. Well, the, I, in fact, there were, there were, it was a, a variety of tropical species. Among them, there was like, um, do you know what Ipe is? They use a lot of it for decks here. Ipe, it's very dense, very durable wood. And in fact, you could even tell the Ipe, after I was there a little while, I recognized the Ipe trees because they would be sticking three meters out of the water because they didn't rot. And it was one of the Ipe logs that sank even though they had two pontoons on it. But there was mahogany, there was Ipe, there were a bunch of species that were not particularly valuable. I mean, I know their scientific names, but they didn't have commercial names because they weren't commercial species. Uh, Espavel, I don't know, you ever heard of that? And anyway, there, there were a number that are very valuable, like the mahogany, marginally valuable, like, or you know, fairly like the Ipe, and then some that were utility woods, like Espavel. There was a lot of that, as you might imagine. The one that's least valuable is the most common, but that's not unusual either. But they, the, the, I, they had set up a portable sawmill there, and it really looked like nice stuff. So why it didn't survive, I don't know. One problem with it, of course, is it's been underwater for 90 years, whatever, and it was really waterlogged. So drying it would be a big problem. 
it would cost a lot more money to dry that wood than your normal forest-grown tree because the, it was completely saturated. Um, so I don't know the economics of it. The economics were probably the part that, uh, that, that caused the project not to be viable because the mechanics of it were really interesting and they could cut a lot of trees in one day. I mean, these guys were very adept. They just moved from tree to tree to tree, cut them off, haul them into the sawmill, and then slice them up into boards. But that's similar to this timeless timbers thing, you know, in that harvesting underwater logs, except in that case, they were harvesting logs that were sinkers. They were, they were you know, being brought to a sawmill someplace, and they were high enough moisture content, and they'd been sitting out there too long and became waterlogged and sank, as opposed to the ones in Panama, which were still in vertical trees. Um, I'm ready. Okay, so for you and your colleagues, where in the world do you believe the first tree is originated from? You know what? I have no idea. <laughs> I would guess, based on the, basically, there, there's what we call primitive anatomical characters and advanced anatomical characters. And for instance, the, the um, softwood trees, the pines, the spruces, they're a much more primitive. So I would guess that maybe in the temperate region, maybe not the far north, but someplace in the mid-latitudes is probably where they started growing, if I had to take a guess. But that's all it is, is a guess. Because certainly the diversity is much higher in the tropics, but that's because the climate's different. You have... Um, many different, um, um, you have many sites that have very different ecology even though they're close to each other. And so that, that would spur diversity. Whereas here, the, 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 the harsh conditions perhaps would limit the um, number of things that could develop differently than what was already there and survive. But I would guess based on the primitiveness of the wood that mid-latitude north would be where they came. And because the diversity is higher, say, in the United States than in Europe, and this is what, you know, this is, you never know what might be valuable in your life. Because when I was in the Army in Germany, I had just recently graduated. I knew the East Coast trees, and I'm out on these field exercises, and there's not much growing there. You know, there's some scotch pine trees and a couple of plants. You know, there was much less diversity. And then I find out later that Europe in the same latitude had much less diversity than, say, the United States. And being as how there's higher diversity in the states, I would guess that it's more likely that things would have originated in, say, what was then the United States than in Europe. But I don't know. That's just a guess. A question here? Uh, because of all the lakes, we obviously have a lot of boats around here. And uh, some of them that we treasure the most are wooden boats. Mm -hmm. What accounts for the way the wood grow, the trees grow, that makes some more immune to the effects of moisture when they're outside or sitting in the water? Well, for instance, decay. I mean, a completely saturated wood, as was demonstrated by the sinker logs, or this, a completely saturated wood will not rot either. It requires air, a decay organization, suitable temperature. Um, I would say that the reason a boat wouldn't rot in the way, some, actually I've seen rotten boats because they, somebody abandoned them, but they, if you haul it out, it dries out, whatever decay organism might have thought it could get a foothold is now going to be stopped when you dry your boat out. Um, there's also a lot of treatment of the woods, either surface or otherwise, in order to prevent that from happening. I'd say a more common problem would be the opening and closing of gaps between the boards because shrinkage is going to occur with well, change in moisture content. Why hmm? does teak not... Oh, because teak is extremely... Teak, teak, for instance, there is natural durability of wood. And teak is an extremely durable wood. The extractives in the wood, that is the, the extraneous components that are maybe 2 or 3% of the total weight of the wood, have very strong antifungal, anti-intact properties. In other words, the attacking organisms don't like them. They, 
They're poisonous, essentially. It's the same principle as injecting a wood preservative into the wood to get the same effect, except that many woods have that naturally. Green heart is another one. It, it just doesn't rot. Ipe is another one. It just, you know, they're just naturally durable. And in fact, that those extraneous components that are very small percentage of the wood, but have a great effect on the properties, such as its decay resistance, those are also the things that this spectrographic analysis is looking at. Because the essence of wood is a cellulose lignin, it's got carbohydrates and hydrocarbons and a few other things, but it's the extractives that really determine the, the, the distinguish between properties of different woods, and the spectrographic analysis ignores all the stuff that's common and focuses on the things that are different, such as the extractive content, which in the case of teak, impart high durability. Now, mahogany is another one that's used in boats, not because it's, it, it's rel moderately durable, but nothing like teak, but mahogany is used because it has very low shrinkage properties. For a given change in moisture content, it shrinks and swells much less than similar species with similar um, density. So mahogany is also a common boat wood, usually not for parts that are underwater, but exposed parts, because with the changes in moisture content you're, gonna have, that you're going to have um, when you're either on land storing the boat or with it in the water, it's going to shrink and swell much less. You're going to have fewer cracks, splits, gaps. So that's another common boat wood. But it's not extremely durable. It's just moderately durable. But you put a surface coat on it. And if you take care of it regularly. Can you have a question? Nope. OK, you mentioned woods that were endangered. What are the woods that you're prohibited from importing or exporting? What are those woods? That you, could you mention some? OK. Well, one notable one is, you ever heard of, I don't know, Br uh, <coughs> Brazilian rosewood, right? That's one. Um, some of the, there are like three main species of true mahogany. One of them, the Caribbean, the one growing in the Caribbean is close to extinction. It grows in southern Florida, too. That species is prohibited. The other species are not. There are three categories of prohibition. One is, it may, in fact, when I say prohibition, it's not prohibited from cutting in the country. You can't make other countries um, do what you want them to do with your reason. But they are prohibited from import into the United States and Europe and other signatory countries. The idea being it will then reduce their commercial value so that it won't be economical to go in and cut them down. But this Brazilian rosewood is one. One of the species of mahogany is one. There are three categories. One is which is prohibited from international trade. And there's maybe a dozen species of wood on that. There's a type of um, true fir, like similar to our balsam fir, but it grows in Guatemala in the, high, in the mountains. That's also one that's prohibited, excuse me, from international trade. Then there's the group two, which requires, they're threatened, they're not prohibited, but they require special uh, permits to import to show that they were harvested from a sustainable source and all of this. And then there are ones that are not, they have, paperwork basically to say where you got it. There are no serious prohibitions, but the essence of it is we need to watch these because they're next on the list of trees that are going to go extinct. But let's say cocobolo, Brazilian rosewood, some species of mahogany, some species of true fir would be among the ones that would have problems uh, in international trade. Yeah. Question back here? Um, as a child, we would go to the Sleeping Bear Dunes in Michigan, and they'd call the petrified forest in the Sleeping Bear Dunes. And I was wondering about that terminology, petrified wood or petrified forest. Is that, the, is that synonymous to a fossil that you speak of? My understanding is that a petrified forest is like what there's a petrified forest in, is it Washington State? This forest in Ethiopia would be a petrified forest because what happens is the trees are still standing erect where they grow. Now, other petrified wood, they've fallen over. You get little pieces of it here and there. I wouldn't call that a petrified forest because the trees are no longer in situ, in the site where they once grew. They had been there. But, um, but I would say a petrified forest to me is one where the trees are still in the ground where they were growing. 
there's a forester, uh, a European forester, by the name of Wolbein, or Wolbein. Uh -huh. uh, he's written a popular book uh, uh, recently. Um, he talks about... Uh, he talks about um, species of trees that when they're under threat, say by insects, uh, they release uh, chemicals which the same species then begins to read um, and they start producing then immune systems uh -huh. before, the, um, before the insect arrives. He also talks about... Um, root systems mm -hmm. uh, of the same species, and they interconnect and sometimes feed each other water mm -hmm. and so on. He uses the word communication for all that. Right. Mm -hmm. Is that word too metaphorical for you, or does that word work? Well, I think I'm trying to think of the title of that. The, 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 the hidden the, the, what? the language of trees. Right. I, I, I think I read, I've read like half of that book, you know, and then I set it aside. And I, it's one of the many books I have. But it all makes a lot of sense to me that these trees communicate with each other one way or another, either through pheromones. Well, I don't think they wouldn't be pheromones. Either through some of the um, gases that they put out or through uh, interconnecting root systems. Now, for instance, walnut trees, of course, are famous for putting out toxins that keep all the competition away from their roots. Others in the tropics, that's allelopathy. Does that name mean anything to you? But anyway, this allelopathy is the ability of certain plants to basically eliminate the competition. And it's famous in the States because it's common in walnut trees. And in there, the allelopathic agent comes through the roots. In the majority of them, apparently, it's something produced by the leaves, and the rain washes it out. But I certainly believe that these plants have ways of communicating with themselves one way or another, in order to ensure the survival of the, the species as a whole. So, yeah, that, that makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. A question over here? Yep. Uh, what efforts, if any, and if it's possible, is being done to um, uh, reinstate trees that are near extinction? I mean, if they're a renewable item, can they be grown? Can they be... Can there be nurseries? Is there any effort going on for these types of trees? Well, there are certainly efforts. Um, when I was living in Costa Rica, one of the research stations there um, had different trial plots, they called it. And they were planting various species of mahogany, antique, and right, they, they basically they were trying to see how they would do. Um, and I would say that they're not doing that well. Some of them, because they were like teak. Teak does very well in some areas, but not in others. But sometimes a pathogen will enter in there and kill them all off. And because they're in nature, especially in tropical forests, you sometimes find one stem in every five square kilometers. You put them in a plantation and all of this stuff is together and the pathogens just can, once they get in there, they just decimate everything. So there are certainly problems that you have in trying to grow the resource. Now, other ways is maybe to grow individual trees, but that's too expensive to do on any practical scale, and I don't know how it would work anyway. So, yeah, there are efforts to propagate these, um, but whether they're going to restore the resource to the condition that those of us that appreciate the ecological aspects of the forest and not just the commercial aspects, I'm not so sure. I mean, it certainly works on a commercial um, scale for trees that are, you know, pine trees in the United States. I mean, they're just huge pine plantations that propagate a resource that is very profitable. But also, they have a rotation of 25 years. They're not concerned about growing the trees for their full lifespan. And they're able to um, control the pathogens, either chemically or otherwise. Right. Um, so I would not look at propagation of rare species as a solution to the problem. My, my view would be you got to let the ones that still exist stay where they are and propagate naturally. But that's my opinion of that. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah um, some things were going around on the internet a couple of years ago about zebra wood. 
uh -huh. from Africa, and I was wondering about, there's also a wood from Central America called Paduk or Padak. Right, uh -huh. Are those endangered or not? Because you can buy them up here in mm -hmm. lumber yards, and the internet is full of them, and I do know somebody that um, made a dresser type of thing with zebra wood, and it was mm -hmm. pretty expensive, but he said it's a difficult wood to work with, but are they endangered or prohibited or anything like that? Well, endangered, I would say that a lot of most, I would say that most valuable tropical woods are endangered to some extent. Now, zebra wood is not on any CITES list, I know, so they must think it's, you know, that it's not yet at the stage where it needs to be uh, uh, listed as a, but this African paddock that you mentioned, there are like four species species that produce this padauk wood. And one of them is in extreme danger. When I, when I went to Gabon most recently, and a main focus of that meeting was how to stop the illegal harvest of padauk, one of the three species they have. However, the three species look a lot alike, but they can be separated fairly reliable if you really focus on the characters. And one of the interesting ways to separate them is with fluorescence, that some woods held under fluorescent uh, light, a, a, a UV light, will fluoresce and others don't. And it turns out that in the African padauk, of which there are maybe three species that I know about, the one that's prohibited fluoresces. So that might be a good way to stop it if you, you know, if you could find out how reliable the fluorescence properties would be. But yeah, I'd say that they're endangered. Um, and I'd say that it's, um, I don't have a lot of hopes for saving these because let's say you're living in Gabon and you earn $600 a year and somebody says, I'll give you $10,000 if you let me cut your tree down and take it. And you're going to say, why not? That is a life-changing event, right? And so that log, which then might be shipped to China, they're, they're, they're big players now. I mean, they're not certainly the only ones. They might make $100,000 to $200,000 out of that log. They paid this guy four or 5000 for it. He thinks he's rich, but certainly the resource is poorer because of it. Now, how are you going to stop that? I mean, until you solve the, the poverty problem in general, you know, I don't, I don't know how hungry I'd have to get before I'd start looking at alternatives to legality. A question back yep. here. Hi. Um, I was, I'm really curious about the, uh, the fossilization process of, of wood. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering if, if that process of turning it from you know, a live tree to a fossilized tree, and you're looking at these pieces, uh, if that changes anything anatomical about it that you're looking at for signatures or if there are any surprising things you saw in these fossilized woods compared to modern wood mm -hmm. or if there are any surprising things about wood 20 million years ago compared to modern times that's uh, mm -hmm. worth mentioning. Well, what was most surprising to me is how well preserved this wood is and how much it looks like modern woods if it's well preserved. Now, in the, in, the, in the process, basically it has to be submerged in water or mud or something. It infiltrates it with minerals, and over many, many thousands of years, it replaces some of the components of the wood with, like, silica, for instance. And depending on how much uh, uh, degradation the wood went before it reached this stage or during this stage, I guess would determine the extent to which it is well-preserved or poorly preserved. Some of the Ethiopian woods that I looked at were not very useful because they had not been well-preserved. But you look at some of the well-preserved ones, and they are just astonishing like modern, freshly cut wood. Now, the only difference between the characteristics of the fossil wood and modern woods is that the characteristics you find are not found in those areas now. It's not that they don't exist somewhere. It's just that they're not found in the woods that might be growing in the area now, which means they suggest a climatic or some other thing. But the, wood, the woods all ju look just like any fossil wood I've ever looked at, I could find a modern wood that had characteristics just like it. So I would say that 
it doesn't particularly change. Now, sometimes things like the rings would be very irregular because if this stuff is buried under mud and is a big load, it will distort it that way. And so sometimes measurements are, you know, if you want to measure the diameter of these vessels, these, tri these um, conducting cells, sometimes they're squashed so that they're no longer round, they're oval. And so you're not sure whether they were oval originally or whether they were oval because of the pressure. So you've got to constantly be attentive to the fact that some of these characteristics are in fact what we would call artifacts, which are modified characteristics that are different than the original. But usually, it's fairly clear which are the normal characteristics and which are the ones that have been caused to be changed by the fossilization process. Like, for instance, extremely irregular growth rings. Something happened to distort the growth rings. Or extremely misshapen wood elements. Is there anything similar to DNA testing that can help identify wood species? Is there any? Similar to DNA testing? People are working on that. The trouble with that, and you know, if this is sort of like things that I would have said were impossible are now being done routinely. <laughs> <laughs> DNA, the problem with DNA is that DNA traditionally has had to come from living tissue. So is there DNA that's usable in wood? Well, maybe. I mean, there's some, one of the people at the Forest Products Lab is looking at the DNA question, trying to find out, can you salvage DNA from dead wood and determine what species it is? And so far, no answer. But just like a lot of other things that I would have said, gee, that'll never happen. Maybe somebody will figure out a way to do it. I mean, DNA testing in people, that was unheard of 40 years ago. Now it's routine. So I'd say, I, I certainly wouldn't say don't look at it, you know. I, I have, I'm a little skeptical, you know, for a dead piece of wood to produce DNA that's usable, but maybe it worked. One question uh, someone had asked about the illegal woods that are potentially coming into the U.S. And I think people here might be familiar with the Gibson guitar case where mm -hmm. the, the rosewood that you mentioned, they were mm -hmm. bringing in, I think, for the string bridge or right. I can't remember mm -hmm. what part. Mm -hmm. That's an example of a wood that was not supposed to be coming into the U.S., but it was, and it was being used by a major manufacturer. Right. Mm -hmm. Can you comment a little bit on, not to pick on China, but we, we may stop certain species from coming into the, U the U.S. Or, the, or Europe, but, but China may not follow those rules as much mm -hmm. as we do, so there still may be markets for some of these endangered tropicals. Right. I mean, in fact, that's sort of like a parallel to that might be the ivory trade, which is pretty much curtailed here, but according with this meeting I went to, you know, in other markets, I mean, not to pick on China, but right now, they're in a stage of their development where they don't care too much about the rules, it seems to me, right? Um, and so, they see the possibility of their developing. They got a lot of people. They're still relatively, and it's profitable, and so they maybe not, don't sign some of these agreements. Um, so, uh, yeah, and, and there certainly are buyers. There are also, wealthy people in Africa that will buy some of the woods that, in that case, it's perfectly legal because it's the international trade that's prohibited. Um, so, I, I don't know. Uh, I, would, I mean, it would be nice to get everybody on board with, um, with uh, conserving the uh, valuable species that might go extinct otherwise. But, I mean, until you get rid of all kinds of other inequities, I don't see that happening. Oh, one more. <laughs> With a warming climate, uh, what sort of vulnerabilities do North American uh, tree species potentially face? Well, certainly, certainly insects, right? I mean, the, the emerald ash borer is moving in. Um, in, in, in West Virginia, when I was there, uh, what's the thing that attacks the, the spruce trees? They, the, right, or the, the balsam, adelgid, right? 
you know, the climate gets a little bit warmer. Uh, you've got a lot of the sulfur dioxide drifting into the east, into the mountains, and weakening the trees. The insects get in there. It's got a better, it's better climate than they used to have, and so they can do a lot of damage because they are now, their, their conditions are much more um, conducive to their expansion and survival. So I see, I see that as a problem, changing climate. Um, I don't see it as in, insurmountable because, as I would say from the Oregon fossils or the Ethiopian fossils, the climate's always changing. The question is why and how fast. And, uh, and, as I, and, and like in the case of, the, right, am I correct on that? But in the balsam woolly adelgid, a, a big part of that is acid precipitation that weakens the trees. So it's not just the climate which is more susceptible, it's weaker trees now that at one time would have been able to fight it off, now can't. So it's a, it's a complicated problem. Um, Okay, well, thanks to Mike Wyman for a wonderful presentation tonight. <laughs> thanks again to our sponsors, UW Trout Lake Station, UW Kemp Natural Resources Station, the Lakeland Badger Chapter of the Wisconsin Alumni Associ Association, Monaco Public Library, and uh, thanks to our hosts here, uh, Monaco Brewing Company. Thanks to everyone. Remember, our next Science on Tap will be September 6th, and our topic will be the future of farming in northern Wisconsin. And watch for the sign-up for our field trip. And sign up for email reminders in the back. And also, we have Kemp Natural Resources Station um, events uh, that will go on all summer in the back as well. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Have a great summer.